everyone. Can you hear me okay? Okay. As you know, I'm Dr. Alice Madani. I'm a pediatric resident at LSU Shreveport, and I'm a Grand Rounds is about, as Dr. Cooper said, emergency preparedness and disaster preparedness and peds. Disclosures. I have no relationship with this industry to disclose that are relevant to the content of a CME activity. First, I'm going to explain our overall outline. We'll go with the basics. What is a disaster? What is emergency preparedness? Who's involved? What are their functions? And more importantly, um, what is the pediatric role in this, as well as any medical care provider? I'll talk about the phases of the emergency response, and that kind of ties into my objectives. My objective today would be to highlight the pediatric special needs and emergencies, to demonstrate tools that can be applied in emergencies, and to incorporate emergency preparedness in everyday practice. So I'd like to first start about what inspired me to talk about this. I was listening to NPR, and those who are fans of NPR, twice a year they have a money drive. and. I was listening to it and they were saying, you know, why we should uh, donate because we have great shows. And they talked about a radio lab which had a podcast called um, Playing God. And that's a pretty catchy title. So while I'm not the typical person who will Google their podcast, I did this time. And I was hooked the entire hour. It um, involved a hospital. It was Memorial Hospital in New Orleans. And this lady, Sherry Fink, she's a doctor and a journalist, and she spent years there and hundreds of hours interviewing. And not being from Louisiana myself and hearing about Katrina, you know, kind of like secondhand, not, not being from here, it really, um, really touched my heart. And so after learning that, I started to like internalize what would I do if I was, you know, on the ward and the pick you it's a 24 and I'm the only like upper level there and and we just have like a skeleton crew and, and what where do we go what do we do and because I didn't have those answers I thought you know what I want to look more into this this is a really interesting topic so I hope you find this interesting too basic definitions I know these are pretty obvious but sometimes you know it's nice to get them clear in our head Disaster is a serious disruption of the functioning of the community or society involving widespread human, material, economic, or environmental loss and impacts, which exceeds the ability of the affected community or society to cope using its own resources. So in other words, something bad really happened. We've had, you know, we've had some sort of loss, and we have trouble um, coping and recuperating back to normal. Um, a more medical definition comes from the WHO. It says, it defines a disaster as a sudden ecological phenomenon of sufficient magnitude to require external assistance. So in the medical aspect, um, we're not able to provide the care that we need to, to do, and that, that is a disaster. I chose this busy slide because I liked that it had a bunch of disasters. Um, we have everything from, you can see at the top, actually on the corners, a lot of the natural occurring disasters like tsunami, fires, floods. Um, and then in the middle, we have more of the man-made interventions like bombings, um, shootings. And in the center, I put children since 
we're focusing on children today. This is just a category breaking down for people who like lists more than pictures. Um, I have the natural disasters, accidents, and man-made. And I particularly enjoyed um, seeing the big picture because this, um, this talk and this subject, it can be applied to many different areas. Um, for example, pandemics, even though I won't be talking about that today, that's something that's really real for us. And most likely, you know, we can come across that as well. Besides the typical natural or man-made disasters, some, sometimes some things are more publicized than others. And as you see, often one disaster can lead to another. What is emergency preparedness? I made this definition up. It's a broad area of study that encompasses the planning, practice, and impl Im implementation of guidelines designed to assist human beings in their survival. After learning about all the different aspects, I kind of came up with that idea. Um, emergency preparedness requires anticipation of risk and plans to mitigate. So it's not just about um, the drills and so forth. You have to know, you know who is vulnerable as well. Um, there's also the phases of preparedness, the prevention, the mitigation, prepared, preparedness response, and recovery. And this is a plan that isn't um, stagnant. It evolves over time. And that's because whenever we have disasters or experiences similar, we learn from them and we um, fix the plan. It evolves. This is another slide to give you a big picture. If you look from like the top down, um, that's sort of like the government is at the top. We have Homeland Security and FEMA. These are just two examples of governmental institutions that are involved in emergency preparedness. And then at the local level, you can see there Louisiana, that must be a pelican or a different type of bird. Um, and then at the local level, we have um, our Cato uh, Bossier office. And then separating from governmental institutions that are involved with this are uh, medical associations like pediatric, family medicine, internal medicine, emergency medicine. And there's even fellowships in this, if, if you can imagine. Besides professional um, organizations, we have organizations, uh, humanitarian organizations. One ex famous example is American Red Cross. And then we have private institutions like our hospitals, university health, our schools, our daycare centers. All of these people need to be part of the plan. So you can see that it's a very, very wide reaching topic. Here's just another example. I didn't talk about the individual families, but they are, they are the root of everyone. I found this, this is an article that talked about disaster preparedness, but they, in talking about it, they you know, posed questions like, do you know who this is? Do you know who this is? Um, and then they had a table of all the, the groups that they were mentioning, because I didn't know these groups at all. So I put them here, because these are just a, a huge variety. Um, what I found interesting were the vet, uh, veterinary disaster assistance plan, um, as we know, the care of animals is, is also important because people will love their animals and that often affects how we implement care. We need to care for the animals as well. So let's focus on what is really important, the pediatrician role or the medical professional role. Um, we have a duty and uh, to be educated, to stay updated. We need to share our specialized training a lot of these emergency plans, they involve adults, adult medicines, doses, and triage systems. They don't always take in, in, into account the pediatric patient, and they're not always sensitive. And, and that's understandable. I mean, they're not studying pediatrics like we are. So because we know that, and that's, that's our expertise, we should share that information so that these plans are more efficient. On another level, we should talk to parents, and I'll highlight that more now about disaster plans and, and bringing the conversation up with children. And then, as a, being a pediatrician, a pediatric resident, and a future pediatrician, we should join. We can join the Disaster Preparedness Contact Network. That gives us up-to-date articles and also allows you to be involved in activities. And this was uh, this information was um, obtained from the AAP website under Children Disasters. So why are children special? 
a lot of the literature I read talked about um, the special needs of children and it and it said how sometimes that category is a disservice to children because it lumps them with all the other special groups and those special groups aren't necessarily the same um, one point would be development. We all know that children develop at different stages and you know, with that development, you know, they come into a disaster, they might not have the same cognitive abilities or motor abilities that they need to escape from a disaster or to understand or to explain. Um, these are very important things. Also on the caretaker side, uh, for people caring for patients that are pediatric range, they might not know what a child can do and they might you know, over or underestimate uh, that child's needs. I found this interesting. This was actually from the AAP too. They said that the respiratory rate, because the respiratory rate is faster, they're actually more vulnerable to aerosolized biological and chemical agents. That's, that's yeah. Um, also, I found this quite interesting. They were saying that serine and chlorine gases, because they're more dense, they tend to fall to the ground. And our smaller children are going to be more at risk because they're going to have a higher concentration of that. On the flip side, they have a larger skin to surface body mass ratio. So absorption of, of these chemicals that are hazardous are going to be more in the child compared to an adult. Um, other issues would be the less body fluid reserve. So any type of agents that can cause vomiting and diarrhea, they're more likely to have dehydration as a result. And a similar issue with smaller circulating volumes, more likely to go into shock. Um, and then the loss of motor skills I sort of addressed at the top already. Other considerations of why children are special, uh, they're influenced by the emotional state of their caregivers. So. We see this um, in the clinic, um, and we, you know, even in our own lives, we know some parents are better handling things than others, and it, and it, you know, falls back on the children too. I mean, the children have enough to deal with, you know, dealing with a disaster, and then to have a parent that can't cope well. I mean, that's an, an extra thing that they have to deal with. Um, also, it says that they're more vulnerable during food and agricultural incidents. Um, they also have special needs in that area. They have formulas and different types of formulas, and it's not like you can have one type of food to feed all types of children. Along those lines, uh, specific supplies, mostly with the equipment size. Um, we see that with like transport. Like if we want to transport mass amounts of children, we might need, um, you know, car seats. You know, that, that can be a limiting factor. Or, um, you know, medical equipment, that's pretty obvious that we deal with that every day with like intubation and so forth and NG tubes. But um, it's probably easier to, to supply things for adults than it is for children because there's so many different types of sizes for them. All right, this is just a break. Take a breath. Or maybe I should take a breath. All right. A little bit more deeper into the subject. Emergency response in a mass casualty incident. So I want the audience to get involved. Um, mostly the residents and the students are who I'm requesting, but anyone can get involved. So we're going to read the story, and then we are going to break up into groups. So I'll start. A bus filled with Bossier Elementary students and caregivers leaves for a drive into the countryside to see the Gator Park and Exotic Zoo when the driver was texting and swerves off the road to avoid a head-on collision with a tank truck. The vehicle is damaged. Some children and caregivers escape and others are screaming and crying. You and two other pediatricians are on the scene. You have limited supplies. Um, mass casualty incidents. So oftentimes we think of a large amount of people. Um, in this case, it is still considered a mass casualty incident and that's because the definition involves a discrepancy. It's when the casualty, you know, casualties that you have are greater than the resources that you have. And as I purposely put it, put just three uh, residents or pediatricians in there with a whole bus full of children. So more a little bit about mass casualty incident. Um, it's an incident in which the medical services, as I said, resources could be personnel, equipment, are overwhelmed by the number and severity of the casualty. When it says mass casualty event, that means that happened in the hospital. Okay? There's a rescue chain in, these, in mass casualty, I'll call them MCIs. 
Um, you have EMT, fire, police, public service, and hospitals involved. The response varies depending on the disaster. As we can see, there's many types of disasters. You're not going to treat them all the same. And the person on the scene um, is the one who declares it. And when it's declared, you have like a chain reaction of the plan being enacted. Um, and it can be broken down into three separate phases, the triage, the treatment, and the transport to definitive care. Often that definitive care is the hospital. So right now we're going to break up into groups of three. Um, and I want each of you to sign yourself roles, um, either the first responder, the transport, and receiving health care unit. And depending on your role, I want you to write an objective of what you think you're supposed to do in that role and how you accomplish it. And then with that scenario of the bus, I want you guys to talk it through. And I'm doing this without giving much introduction because I think we're going to problem solve. We're going to absorb more if we try to figure things out on our own. OK? So cooperate, everyone. <laughs> and I'll go back to the story. <laughs> Give a few minutes. Okay, everyone. Um, all right. I was kind of checking out a few groups, and I like the discussions, um, the thought processes. Um, one person even knew about triage colors, and so um, I heard I heard a lot of good things. Um, some things I did hear were like, you know, I'm going to call, use my cell phone, call 911 uh, for help. So sometimes in disasters. Uh, the, the landlines are actually down, and then the cell phones, you know, they're kind of overburdened. So sometimes, like, you might think that you have things that will work, but they don't. Um, other things that I heard were, like, okay, I'm just going to get them in the car or my ambulance, and I'm going to drive them off. But if it's a disaster, like, if it's in this case, that, that would work. Um, and other types of disasters, you know, flooding, fire, whatever it is, like, getting out might be actually pretty hard. Um, that's some things that I was just thinking about when I was hearing. But good job, and thanks for participating. OK, so moving on. Um, so now we're going to talk about the five patients. We're going to practice triage. Um, here are five patients. Uh, first one is a three-year-old male, um, no vitals, GCS of three. A metal bar pierced through his left mid-chest. Put that on purpose on the left. A seven-year-old female, no vitals, GCS3, despite intubation. That's key. Um, our third patient is a five-year-old with cystic, uh, cerebral palsy, I'm sorry, a G-tube, wheelchair-bound. Uh, he vocalizes. Heart rate 100, blood pressure 95 over 55, and respiratory rate 20. And just so you know, those are Harriet Lane normal for this patient. Um, and then we have a six-month baby with dysmorphic features who responds to airway maneuvers. And lastly, a 20-year-old non-pregnant female, GCS15, with head injury. And I put her there because technically she's in the definition of a pediatric patient still. Okay, so without giving you um, a method of how to triage, I want you guys to triage on your own. What would you do with these patients? Like, um, the basic idea would be, you know, some patients aren't going to do well, and so, yes. Are we still operating under the assumption that we only have three adults? Um, that are functional? That if you want. <laughs> I didn't think about that. If you want. I need to know how many people I have at my disposal. Yes, so that's a good point. Okay, so <laughs> well, these are going to be the first responders. The first responders on the scene. Uh, but the responders on the way. Yeah, but help is on the way. An ambulance is on the way. Sorry. So, so I do I do on field trips a lot. So I actually have disaster. Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> Let's see my I shot through a lot of middle school field trips. Oh, yeah. Well, I think that's right. Okay. Let me see. Don't question that. <laughs>
also like Good job. I had some good discussions, and we're going to talk about those discussions in a second. Um, so this small group activity with the scenarios, I added a little bit to the story, but um, I specifically used that because there um, was a study involving pediatric residents and med-ped residents, and they wanted to see how they did when they taught them disaster preparedness and um, demonstrated the skills, and then they evaluated them. And they, used, they went, were looking for a tool and how good that tool was to evaluate um, their learning process. And so they had standardized these patients, and they had you know, assigned them an answer. So I kind of went off that, and that's how we got that. Um, so the rescue chain starts. This is like talking back at disaster, disaster and um, mass casualty incident. A rescue chain starts at the disaster site. It's the initial assessment. There's a command and control, a search and rescue, and field care. Um, it involves transfer of victims to appropriate facilities. Realize that sometimes that could just be just letting them go home, if that's the possibility. It could be going to a local hospital. It could be um, going to a trauma hospital like University Health because we have you know, trauma surgeons and you know, people that can take care of the more complex uh, patients. Um, once that patient gets to the hospital, the hospital itself will have its own um, preparedness plan in action. And this whole process ends with the victim receives all the emergency care that they need to be stable. I know a lot of this is kind of broad and it sort of has been that way in my reading, but um, hopefully with these activities and getting a little bit of a tidbit of things that you'll learn something. Um, this is from the AAP, um, and I took all the graphs together, again, to get the big picture. Um, at the very top, no oh, good. The very top, this is where you have like the chain, this is like the first responders, the um, people who transport, and then the hospital. And as you can see, transport can go in and out of the hospital depending on the state of the patient, or even like what is going on in the hospital itself. Maybe it's, um, it's capacity, it, it's reached a surge capacity. Uh, this picture here is an example of the story we talked about. Here's the bus. And as you can see, they um, organize their place. Um, yes, Sarah is nodding her head. Um, they organize their place into different categories, and that has a lot to do with the people involved in emergency preparedness. Um, so as you can see, I mean, they even accounted for like the media and reserved area, and then there's like how access control, how people get in and out. Um, and that um, example can change with a different disaster as we see down here. In this example, this, whatever this is, leaked um, gas out, and noticing that the wind is blowing it this way, we don't want to set all our patients that we've just rescued in an area exposing them to further hazards. So, so there's a lot of things to think about, and you almost have to do the, the skill and run the drill to anticipate some of the things. Um, and an important part of this is communication on all levels. As you can see, we've got the hospital and the EMS, and we have like you know other organizations. They all have to work together for um, a smooth process. So I summarized it as they organize their space. Um, you have to stay safe, make sure to stay out of the area that is still dangerous. Um, like when we do checkout with uh, residents during shifts, this is a lot like a checkout in the sense that you 
Um, you identify the victims, you um, kind of assess what their problems are, you um, communicate what type of treatment they have, and you do that to the next uh, group of people that will be taking care of your patient. Um, also, the, at the disaster site, there's the care of victims that we talked about. I've heard some people saying that they would stabilize patients and so forth. Um, also is the search and rescue. In the case of the bus, our patients were all there, but in other situations, we actually have to go and find them, and that's another added um, difficulty to the process. And then what we, oops, sorry, what we know best is um, medical management, so you know, your ABCs, IV fluids, and so forth that you can actually do at the site. This is a triage system that is used in adults, um, but we are going to use the pediatric triage. Um, it is called, let me put it right here, this is called Jump Start, and um, if you can remember, oh goodness, I should have given you the scenarios, but how about I read, well, we'll walk through them, how's that? We'll walk through the scenarios so that we can go through them together, since I have the scenarios right here. So in our first patient, we had um, the child who had a bar going through the left side of the chest. They didn't have any vitals, and um, I put a GCS of three. So using this algorithm for peds, um, the first question is, oops, can they walk? So what would the answer be to that? No. So you, know, you go down. Are they breathing? No. Um, you reposition their airway, and then uh, they're basically apneic, and so they're considered deceased in an emergency situation. So in sometimes in these cases, these patients might have to stay at the site um, in very dire situations, and other situations we're able to transport them to like, you know, a morgue, and that would be their transport place. Um, our second child um, was, this child, um, I don't have their age written down here, but they were intubated and they had no vital signs. So again, if you go down the scenario, they can't walk, they're not breathing, they're apneic, um, no palpable pulse. So again, this is another patient that would be deceased. And so they would be colored black. And when you're at, um, when you're doing triage, you can do triage at any, at any place, and you're supposed to do it everywhere, actually. You're supposed to do it at the site. You're doing it during the transport. You're doing it when they arrive at the hospital. And anytime they get treatment, you re-triage them because your treatment or their status can change throughout time. And so it's really important to be specific on what they need, not to over or under triage. So that's why it's a constant process. Um, and in the process, and in the process, I'm using the same words twice, um, you can use uh, color coding um, like cards. You can write on their gowns. Um, there's different ways, that bands, there's different ways to identify patients this way. Um, in the book that I was talking about in the very beginning, they, they had all the patients come to the second floor and two doctors went through all the patients in the hospital that were still there and hadn't been rescued. And, you know, they flipped through the chart, took a look at the patient, and then, you know, gave them like a number. It's really, really hard. Um, our third patient that we will triage this is our patient that had the head injury. She was a 20-year-old female, um, but she had like a GCS of 13. So in this case, she could walk, she's breathing, she has a normal respiratory rate, she has a normal pulse, and um, the bottom green is about like the GCS. And so she, I mean, in certain situations, maybe in the bus, she might be able to, you know, go home. Okay, so not everyone needs to be transported. Obviously, we wanna make sure she gets home safely. Um, let's see, our next patient is, uh, this is our baby. Our baby, our dysmorphic features baby with uh, apneic and responding to airway maneuvers. So let's go through this one. Um, is the baby walking? No. no. Is the baby breathing? Yes. No. Um, yeah, I guess so first wasn't and then they're apneic and then they did rescue breaths and then they were breathing. So they were like a red. So they're, um, they're really important. A red color is, you know, immediate care. This baby would, you know, go by airplane, not airplane, by helicopter or by ambulance to like a trauma center, okay? So right now we have like a black, you know, stays red, it gets treatment right away, a green can go home, and the one in the middle is yellow. It's like the traffic lights, you know, stop, go, 
menopause. Um, and so our last patient would basically go down to the yellow. And that patient needs medical care, um, but not as urgent as the red. Um, this jumpstart algorithm, um, what's different from the adult is that it accounts for apnea. And so um, it kind of gives kids another chance to be triaged in a better spot than being in a black spot. And also kids that are in the yellow that can't walk, they need to be held. They're, according to this, it says they need to be yellow. So kids that can't ambulate need to be yellow. Okay, so I gave the answers. According to that article, they put them as green, but when I referenced another situation about not ambulating, I'm like, can we make them yellow? So that's our answer right there. Okay, this is our last group activity. Uh, patients start arriving at the hospital, and you are told the ages, injuries, and treatment received, as well as an update in route. That's the reporting that the person at the site needs to give you. So here's our patient. They're a five-year-old who is stable at the disaster site and en route, they go into cardiac arrest on arrival. CPR is started, you obtain IV access. Then you need to give epinephrine every three to five minutes. But how much do you give? You don't have a weight on this child, right? So this was a problem that was um, thought about from an ER doctor. And he went through several um, scenarios or codes where he noticed that you know, with adults, it's so easy. It's the same thing all the time. He felt really confident. But with children, I mean, he was a little bit nervous. You know, I mean, there's parents. It's just there's a lot of tension there. And so I mean, this is amazing how he thought about this. But he came up with a method called the Handevi method. Has anyone heard of this? OK, so take your hand. And you start with ages. Now, obviously, it doesn't go with all the ages, but one, three, five, seven, nine. So these are the ages. One, three, five, seven, nine. And on top of that, you do the weights. So you start with 10. So 10 kilograms, 15, 20, 25, and 30. And with that, you can estimate the, the weight of the child. It's a rough estimate, but you can um, do the estimate of the weight of the child. And with that, you can you move the decimal point over one to the left, and that's the volume that you give in epinephrine. <coughs> that was the example that was given in the paper that I read. This method can be used um, for eight other drugs, um, two different types of epinephrine of different doses, amiodarone, sodium bicarb, dextrose, normal saline, lorazepam, and diazepam. Um, and he's not named Dr. Um, Antevi, and he uses hands, so somebody in the audience one time coined this phrase. Um, there's actually more to this because he's developed um, a pediatric, uh, what are the, the tapes, the, the length, yes. And so um, there is, he, I think he's developed more of an extensive method, but I think you have to buy his product, and so I didn't go that far into it. But we can, we can practice this example, it was quite interesting. Um, for the five-year-old, if you use your hand, one, three, five, and then 10, 15, 20, you'll know that the patient might be 20 kilograms before they even get there. Move the decimal point over to the left one, so that's two mils of the epi. Kind of interesting, right? <laughs> OK. So um, I always think of Dr. Rice, and I think of um, with Braslow. Um, this is a pediatric length-based length tape. Um, those that have done PALS, we have this right here, right here. And um, it's important to know red to head, so you place a child down and you measure it, and based on where their feet is, um, it gives you a color, which gives an estimate weight range, which tells you the sizes of all the emergency um, equipment that you need, which is very helpful. And I think this other man or doctor has done the same thing because there's articles that compare the two processes. So I asked, which is better? It still seems that the Braslow is better in terms of um, the, doing the length-based measurements and estimating the weight. Um, but what was interesting is when they did this study, they took out the obese kids, because these weight ranges um, are for ideal weight. And a lot of our patients might not be ideal weight, and so it kind of throws everything off. So they took that out of the study. But then when they put that back in, Braslow was still better than um, Handevi. Um, Handevi was better for the shorter kids in estimating the weight, and then Braslow was better for the taller kids. But I think that's pretty insignificant, and just we'll go with Braslow. Um, in terms of administering the dose of dextrose, um, 
is like a medication, the Hendevi um, had fewer errors. That was another part that uh, they brought up in, in the literature about dosing errors in children, especially in emergency situations, it's pretty common. And uh, so patients are at risk for this. All right, our next topic, kind of switching off to something else important. I hope it's not too fragmented for you, but this was another area of interest. So this doctor, he's a spinal surgeon, works at Johns Hopkins. Um, in 2010, a man whose mother was operated by him was, um, came and shot him. He was supposedly just wounded, and then he, um, it was a murder-suicide. And after that event, uh, John Hopkins researchers were pretty interested in, you know, what, what is our risk? Are we at risk for, for being shot? Um, so they, re they took the data from 12 years um, of hospital shootings. There was about 154 shootings, um, and it came down to about 148, 148 hospitals, 235 victims and between the year of 2000 and 2011. Um, and then they came up with some uh, patterns of who's at risk for shootings, and I thought this was pretty interesting. Um, another group also studied, this was uh, published in the September 2012 annals, um, annals of Emergency Medicine, um, where it talked about workplace violence, and it may occur more frequently than gunfire, which is uh, relatively rare. And if you notice in the AAP news this month, there's actually an article about workplace violence and how to diffuse it. Um, just some things I thought were interesting where before you go into the room, um, make sure you don't have anything sharp or dangerous. Um, you know, anything, just take it out. Your stethoscope even, they say, you know, remove it for strangulation. Ties, kind of take it off. Um, and then everything else in the article seemed pretty standard about, you know, having empathy and compassion and being patient and so forth. Now, while uh, the Johns Hopkins study wasn't too alarming for um, our risk for hospital shootings. An FBI study, which was published a little bit later, did show an increase from 6.4% per year to 16.4. And it seems from what I've been hearing on the news that we're just expecting it to get more. Here's our break. All right. So here's some of the trends. Uh, I found interesting. So 59% occur actually in the hospital. 41% occur on the hospital grounds. It could be like the parking lot. Uh, most common perpetra perpetrator is the male, 91%. Uh, location most likely is the ER, um, then the parking lot, then the patient's rooms. In one article I found that um, after the ER, the next most popular place in the hospital is um, the labor and delivery area. So that is interesting. Um, the, U <laughs> the U.S. Bureau of Labor and Statistics um, in 2015 noted a 46% increase from 2014 in homicides. While the numbers are small and so it looks like there's a great increase, um, I still think they're significant because any type of homicide is a homicide. Um, and then a 2015 study at Brown University found 241 incidents um, between this 15-year span. Um, they noticed some trends in geographic, so this is important for us. Um, majority were in the south, then the midwest, and then the west and the northeast, and then the most common was a crut, grudge, not a crush, uh, social violence, escape, and suicide ideation. Uh, Homeland Security um, has put out a video, and the key words to remember are run, hide, fight. That's what you're supposed to do in a mass um, shooting, run, hide, fight. But instead of watching this video, I was going to have us watch the one for hospitals. Oh, that's mine. Hello, I'm Dr. Virginia Kane, director of the Marion County Public Health Department. The model policy your healthcare organization will be using and the training video you're about to watch are based on guidelines developed by the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. As you will see, we've applied these recommendations for healthcare settings in our community. I encourage you to watch this video, perhaps a few times, and commit the idea of run, hide, fight to memory. I also encourage you to speak to your colleagues, administration, and management about what you learn and what policies and procedures are in place at your facility to help you survive an active shooter incident. This training will force you to imagine the unimaginable. 
but I hope you will imagine it and think of how you could respond if this happened on your floor in your clinic or on your shift. Your life may depend on it. Thank you. As healthcare professionals, it's hard for us to imagine facing an active shooter taking lives in the very places where we work so hard to save them. Sadly, shootings can happen anywhere, including hospitals and healthcare facilities. While we all hope we will never have to face this kind of deadly situation, it's absolutely critical to understand what to do if an active shooter enters your facility. That is why the MESH Coalition, representatives from Marion County Hospitals, and advisors from law enforcement work together to research and propose a model policy for responding to an active shooter in a healthcare setting. This policy, approved by the boards of directors for both the MESH Coalition and the Indianapolis Coalition for Patient Safety, serves as a template so that Central Indiana hospitals and healthcare organizations can create their own facility-specific policies for responding to active shooter incidents. An active shooter incident can occur in your facility on any day at any time. Excuse me. Yeah. Where's 214 at? 214 is right down there. Thanks. Okay. Anything we need to know about? Pain. What am I going to You have just seconds to react and three actions you can take to help make yourself safe. Run, hide, or fight. The perpetrators are varied. The venues that they select are varied. The victims that they select are varied. Their mindset is to create the most amount of havoc, death, and destruction in the shortest amount of time that they possibly can. With this type of training, it ensures that all of our hospital and healthcare providers understand how our emergency first responders will be reacting to these situations. So that we will have similar response, people will have similar training, it will make it much easier, and as a result, could potentially save lives. In law enforcement, the common phrase is you will react as you have trained. So you're going to do something. The question is, are you going to do something that could potentially save your life? What was that? What was that? Staff, let's go. Let's go. This way. This way. This way. Hurry. 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 Let's go. If you can't evacuate the area, leave immediately. Don't bother to take anything with you. Encourage others to go with you. But if they don't follow, don't wait. <laughs> On a scale of 1 to 10, with 10 being stay here, stay quiet. <laughs> if you're with a patient who cannot escape with you, discontinue care and leave. If you can, secure the patient room upon exiting. Do not stop to help the wounded. Exit the area immediately. So running preserves your ability to stay alive and preserves your ability to respond to the patients who may need your care after the incident. We may be abandoning that patient for a short time, but if we aren't there to respond to their medical needs after the shooting incident, we're of no help to them. So think of it as conserving your resources. Exiting, keep your hands raised and visible. If you encounter anyone else, warn them not to go into the area. Avoid pointing, screaming, or yelling while evacuating. If law enforcement is present, follow their orders. Law enforcement will go direct the threat, uh, past casualties, past uh, a lot of victims, be able to end the threat. And it makes a lot of sense because more death is going to fall unless that is done um, as a priority.
Move a safe distance away from the facility. If law enforcement has not arrived, follow your facility's procedures for reporting the incident. This may be to call 911, call facility security, or press a panic button if the area is equipped with one. Make the report even if you think someone else already has. Do not attempt to re-enter the scene until law enforcement has given an all-clear announcement. Depending upon the situation and where you are, your best option may be to hide. The best hiding place is one that is out of the shooter's view, provides protection from gunfire, and doesn't trap you or restrict your movement. Block the door to prevent the shooter from entering and hide behind large objects like cabinets or desks. Remain silent. Look for places where you might be able to hide behind locked doors, maybe a medication room, maybe a supply room. We labeled on our floor the safe places to hide. We've instructed our nurses to barricade the doors, move the beds in front of the door, barricade it, and put the patient, and maybe even yourself with the patient in the bathroom and lock the door, turn off the lights, mm -hmm. just try to act like no one's there. Follow your facility's procedures for reporting the incident, but only if making the call won't give away your position to the shooter. If anyone with you is injured, do what you can to attend to them while remaining hidden. But while you are hiding, you must also think through what you will do if the shooter finds you. Although it should be your last resort, prepare to fight the attacker. Incapacitating any kind of suspect and stopping him from doing what uh, he had been doing your goal there. <laughs> if your life is in imminent danger, prepare to fight. Your goal is to disrupt or incapacitate the shooter. Even yelling or throwing objects can help by confusing the shooter and making it harder to aim. Act as aggressively as possible your commitment to your actions will mean the difference between life and death. The more you have in numbers, the, the greater your chances are uh, to be successful in defeating uh, someone that's even armed. Think of run, hide, fight as more than just what to do when faced with an active shooter. It can be a way of thinking about your surroundings every day. Whether you are always in the same place or you change locations frequently, Make it a point to know key features of your environment. Know where the exits are, including stairwells. Know what rooms can be secured and locked. Know how to lock down your area or unit if possible. Pay attention to where phones are. Find out if the facility has panic buttons and where they're located. Know your facility's procedures for reporting an incident so you know who to call and what to say before you ever have to pick up the phone. Be aware of people around you. Keep in mind that an active shooter won't fit any specific profile. He or she may look like any other visitor, patient, or coworker you might encounter on any given day. We don't want to be too worrisome about it, but we do need to be prepared as a community. We've been trained on what to do in code situations, so the more that we're trained on this and the more that we practice and have drills, the more hopefully your mind will just go into motion. Rehearse in your head what you're going to do if this situation um, were to occur. Where you can hide, where you can exit, what can you use to fight? Okay, uh, for time's sake, I think we got the, the main idea of that. Um, so from this example, I want us to recognize um, some of the warning signs of escalating violence so that it doesn't get to a point where someone has this grudge and needs to come and do a shooting. Um, there are a lot of times when we have patients come in and in certain situations, some patients might be more at risk, um, you know, domestic violent issues or um, abuse patients, abuse cases. I mean, that might be something where you might kind of take a little bit more notice. I mean, we screen for um, Ebola, so, you know, we should screen for this too. Um, as I said, be familiar with your hospital policies on the University Health website. 
Um, it's going to be a code silver. Um, they showed that metal detectors can decrease shootings by about 40%. We do not have metal detectors. I asked our policemen. Um, we have uh, security at entrances. We do, but the policemen have told us that our uh, university police have told us that sometimes you know the staff or residents just let people come in um, using their badge, and you know that, that's that's the way where we put ourselves at risk. So you know we shouldn't do that anymore. Um, alert and panic buttons. We do have those. I want you guys to take notice of where they are. They're usually at the nurses' station underneath. I checked on the fourth floor and I checked on the fifth floor. And we do have them. Um, and then uh, physicians and nurses, as I said, need to assess um, for violence. And you know, they brought up a point about noticing your environment. So when I was talking to the policemen, um, you know, there's a lot of things that go on that we don't know about because that's not our job. It's their job to kind of protect us in that way. And he said that. You know, yeah, a couple months ago, you guys had like three bomb threats, and <laughs> what? Um, and he also said that, you know, if there were ever any type of bomb scare, um, it would be us who would be the one to kind of look around our surroundings and see what doesn't look familiar. So, you know, pay attention. Pay attention, guys. Um, and let's wrap this up, because everyone has work. So um, on a lighter note, um, bringing emergency preparedness to our children and everyday um, like well child visits. We can talk about emergency plans and kits. You can go online at the AAP. They have like some fun lists to do. Um, some points to remember like our patients with um, insulin, um, they need refrigeration. We, uh, I know that we always tell them to wear their bracelets. I mean, in the case of a disaster, if they get separated from their parents and they're not wearing you know, what their medical problems are and they can't communicate to that, that to us. That's really important. So we need to tell our parents, you know, to um, have those identifications, especially in a time of disaster, you know, put them on the child again. Um, teach your kids your name, your first name, last name and address. Have pictures of them, you know, in your phone so that you can identify them um, if needed, if they're lost somewhere. And then um, we also can talk about patients who have, you know, oxygen, who um, need like special utilities at home, um, we can, there's like an application that we can do for the utility system so that they're not turned off in certain situations when it's possible. Um, and then encourage them to talk and then you make it fun. Um, this is the website, I played it. Each of the kids go through a disaster. There's a kid from Louisiana and a kid from California. And then um, here's the AAP's family readiness and then here are like all the modules that the AAP puts out as well. Um, the last point, and quickly, is just about psychosocial support. You know, we, we know a lot about um, depression and post-traumatic stress, and this is one area that um, our kids need to, to do that. And so we need to screen for it because they might not always show the signs. We have to be on the lookout for it. I'll just say thank you, everyone. <laughs> Yeah. Thanks, Alice. That was terrific. And, um, I mean, really a sobering lecture. Um, two things that, that just to remind you that your the disaster callback is on your um, patron uh, card. Uh, the other thing is ask the nurses where the panic button is because it doesn't look like a panic button. It's um, gray. It's gray. And, and it's kind of wide. It looks like an old... You squeeze, squeeze, squeeze it. Yeah, you yeah. squeeze it's a great, it. It's a great box. Yeah. And it, it looks like some type of, you know, like something that you would plug a phone into yeah. or that kind of thing. Does um, that work? I lost your kids. I'm sure they kids did. I know it works whenever I was a resident of the nursery. Right. <laughs> 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 so I'm um, messing with it. And then um, there was, there was a, uh, an out-of-breath cough. What happens when we squeeze this panic button? Is it the police come. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. It's, it's a silent right. Right. Um, okay. right. So if you were trapped somewhere there, they wouldn't hear it. In a pretty short amount of time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everyone.